Welcome to the Vision for Life podcast, an ongoing conversation between the pastors of Fellowship Denver and the church at large. Each week, we talk about life, faith, the Bible, and how to follow Jesus as we go about our daily lives. I'm Autumn, host of the Vision for Life podcast, and Hunter is joining me today. Hunter, welcome. Thanks for inviting me back, Autumn. We were just discussing that we don't have any icebreaker questions today. No one submitted any. Your birthday is passed. So I used up my icebreaker question about your birthday last week. And I'm really um, continuing with this tradition as you have labeled it in, in honor of your request <laughs> that it be a tradition. I did get a couple of icebreaker questions, but they were on the more serious end of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. And we have a serious conversation teed up today. So... Uh, I'll save it for when we have a more lighthearted conversation. <laughs> well, it uh, turns out that I work with kids a lot. And as any good uh, children's leader or youth leader, I just have games queued up, you know, like on the ready all the time. So I have this app on my phone that has icebreaker questions. All right. And you just punch this button that says break the ice. And then it cycles like a, it looks like a magic eight ball. Well, break the then ice then. spits out a question. So we're going um, to turn, turn to this. What did it do today? It says, it's a would you rather. Okay. Would you rather have your flight delayed by eight hours or lose all of your luggage? I would rather have my flight delayed by eight hours because I'm <laughs> always prepared with books. And so I'll, I'll just take that time to read. Traveling like that doesn't stress me out. And by the way, I'm adamantly opposed to people tweeting their travel frustrations. And so if, if you ever catch me tweeting or Instagramming complaints about an airline or about a travel delay, you know that I'm in a really, 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 really dark place and you should intervene right away. All right. We got additional insight <laughs> there <laughs> into Hunter's life and preferences. Okay. Good to know. A way to care for you. If, if you see Hunter tweeting about <laughs> travel issues, then maybe check in on him. Check see in, if he's please. okay. Yeah. Yeah. Come and rescue me. <laughs> We are going to shift into our serious conversation now. We're picking up a conversation that we began a couple weeks ago. The first week we talked about making sense of the Bible, big themes or plot lines that we can trace through the Bible. The second week we talked about the law. And today we're going to continue with the discussion on the subject of judgment. So can you help us lead us into this conversation, Hunter? I think judgment is probably one of the most difficult parts of Scripture and the story that we've talked about for people to embrace, and we should just have the posture of it's in the Bible, and God is good, and He's holy, and He's just, and He's, he's righteous, and so we, we can trust Him. But sometimes we have to really do some work to understand, and, and I think that's not bad and to, to do. This is probably one of the places where people tend to get hung up. We even wrestled a little bit with how to frame up this conversation because I think this loops in what you do, for example, with like Israel possessing the land in the Old Testament and driving out the Canaanites as they were ordered to do. And, and that's a problem for us. Sometimes when we read the Old Testament. It literally showed up in my quiet time this morning in Deuteronomy chapter three. I'm, I'm sitting there reading. I'm like, this is what we're talking about today. But we think the the topic or the heading judgment is the right heading to put this under, and we'll explain why in just a minute. And whether it's those examples in the Old Testament, whether it is Jesus' teaching on hell in the New Testament, I do find this to be a really difficult place for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it has been at times a struggle for me. Also, it does seem in some of these passages that God not only condones, but commands a sort of violence. And so it is just a question that as we read through the Bible, we have to wrestle with. And it has been for me as well. And I can remember wrestling with this as a fairly young Christian, like wrestling particularly with Jesus's teaching on judgment and hell. And the problem I was having in hindsight, was that I wasn't seeing the full picture of it. And and in particular, I was kind of seeing the teaching on judgment abstracted from the story of the Bible. So I didn't really know the big story that we've been talking about the last couple of weeks. I didn't really understand that the whole 
point of what God is doing in history is bringing his kingdom to earth and establishing a a rule and a reign on the earth and and to turn the earth into a place of flourishing where his glory is displayed. I did not understand that story. And so because I didn't understand that story, I just had a very limited, it wasn't necessarily inaccurate, but I had a a limited perspective on judgment that went something like, you know, you're going to die and then God's going to send you to a place. Mm -hmm. And that's just kind of what I understood Christianity to be about. And so without that bigger story, it didn't quite fit like I found that it does when I understood uh, the bigger story. So for me, coming to terms with this was gradual, and it was gradual as I learned the bigger picture of the Bible, and that was a gradual process as well. So that's why coming to terms with judgment was, was gradual for me. But I do think it really helps us when we put it in the context of the bigger story. Mm-hmm. It's interesting that you're mentioning uh, struggling with the idea, the notion of hell. My mind naturally goes to Old Testament passages. But let's start there. Let's start in the New Testament and consider Jesus' teaching about judgment. Jesus' teaching on judgment wasn't new. It it wasn't a fresh idea that he introduced. It was actually a theme that ran throughout Scripture. That said, he is the one who introduces the image of hell or Gehenna as an image for judgment. And in Jesus' teaching, it's a place outside his kingdom. So the way judgment works in Jesus' understanding is when God comes at the end of history and establishes his kingdom on earth, he's going to have to put out of it anything that is opposed to his rule and reign, anything that introduces corruption, that introduces death, that introduces injustice or exploitation into his world. He's going to have to protect his world from it, so he's going to put it outside. And he's going to have to put out anyone who is not reconciled to him and is therefore a participant in all the evil and the injustice that corrupts God's creation. So in Jesus' teaching, it's necessary for God to clean up and put the world to right, and it protects the goodness of his kingdom. It protects life inside so it can flourish. Now, I think Jesus uses these images like outer darkness, weeping and gnashing of teeth, Gehenna. These are all images that he uses. I think he uses those to impress upon us the sadness and the horror of being outside of God's kingdom. If God is good and glorious and just, and he's going to set up a kingdom where that is perfectly displayed— to be unreconciled to that God and to be outside of his kingdom is, ho- is horrible. And, and so I think that's why Jesus uses those terms. But I would just point out it fits within this bigger story. So there's this dual concept, life outside the kingdom of God and life inside the kingdom of God. And this aspect of judgment or these two places is to protect a sort of flourishing within God's kingdom. Is there a particular passage that we could look at that demonstrates this idea or that talks about Jesus' teaching, the way he talked about it? You could go to the very end of the Bible, to Revelation 21, where we see a picture of God's kingdom coming to earth, and it talks about how there's no more mourning or crying or pain anymore in this kingdom, and then it talks about what's outside the kingdom as well. So we could go there, but I think a good place in Jesus' teaching to go is Matthew chapter 13. He tells a parable of the kingdom of God. It's the parable of weeds and and wheat. And so it goes like this in Matthew 13, beginning in verse 24. Jesus says, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field, but while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So right there is a picture of history. <laughs> Jesus is saying, God, God established this world as a, a place to produce good seed, good fruit, abundance, and his enemy has come and has sown evil. So that's, you know, what, what, how Jesus sets up the world. Um, then he says, at the end of time, when the harvest time comes, 
He will gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but he will gather the wheat into his barn. So there's this sorting out of the wheat and the weeds. A little bit later, his disciples are like, hey, can, can, you, can you explain that to us? And, and Jesus says, yeah, the one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, the good seeds is the sons of the kingdom, the weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man, and this is Jesus when he returns, will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. Obviously, those images are startling, and that's the point. They should be. But notice the story. The story is God is turning this world into a place that is free from evil and free from corruption, and the righteous, the ones who are reconciled to him, are going to shine like the sun. It's going to be glorious in the kingdom of their Father, and they're going to be protected from the all the evil and the corruption that had previously been in the world. One thing that's fascinating to me is that people will often get hung up with, like, if there is a good, righteous God, why didn't he do something to put the whole world to right? Like, why does he allow all this to happen? Um, there's there's a stand-up bit by the now uh, late comedian George Carlin, who he he's kind of talking about, this is why he can't believe in God. And, and, and he looks around at the world, and he goes, this is not good work. I quoted it in a sermon a few weeks ago. And the interesting thing to me is the teaching of Jesus answers that God is doing something about the world, and He is going to do something about the world, and what He's going to do is judgment. And and I sit there and go, when we're saying, why doesn't God do something about the world? Like, we are basically asking Him to judge. <laughs> and so we all kind of have this intuitive sense, actually, that we need God to judge. But then when we look at what it actually entails, it is startling, and it, it should sober us up in that we are not the good people, uh, and we're not all just born good people who who just, you know, are waiting for God to eradicate evil. Like, we participate in it. And so there needs to be a way to be saved through the judgment so that we can see the kingdom of God. And that's what the cross of Christ is all about. And, and so, like, the gospel is, to me, the most satisfying answer to this dilemma of of the world as it is and how I want it to be put right and, and even— what I intuitively know needs to happen for Mm -hmm. that, for it to be put right. I think that's one of the central questions in this discussion that people often bring up. Why isn't God doing something about this, Mm. about the state of evil in the world? Or why doesn't he withhold this, the way we experience evil and death and corruption now? There's another question inherent in this discussion that arises regularly is if God is merciful, how could he judge or condemn people to life outside his kingdom or apart from him or in the in some conceptions of hell in a place of pain or suffering. <laughs> there is a couple of th- ways I think scripture answers that. One is that we do see God's mercy in two ways. We see it in his patience and we see it in his provision of a savior and in him actually taking the judgment himself. So this is Jesus experiences the full weight of the outer darkness that he describes and the weeping and the gnashing of teeth that he describes. He he experiences the full weight of that. So this is not a God who just pronounces this and does it, but but this is actually a God who in his mercy takes that for for all who who want to be reconciled to him. Then you also will see the apostles emphasizing God's patience. You especially see this in in 2 Peter. Peter is wrestling with the fact that like Christ has not returned and put all things to right yet. And and he's he's telling his 
his his people to, to be patient. <laughs> and, and and he says to them in First Peter three, he says, the, the Lord's not slow to fulfill his promise, but he's patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. So part of the delay is God's patience waiting for the gospel to go forward and for people to reach repentance. And and then Peter says, but the day of the Lord will come. It will come like a thief, meaning it'll it'll come unexpectedly, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. So Peter is saying God is going to judge, and he's patient, and his patience should not be interpreted as he won't ever do this. The last thing we see in God's mercy, and, and mercy is a biblical term that doesn't just mean that God like gives people what they don't deserve. It also means that he has compassion on the hurting and the suffering that, that we often experience because of our own sin and because of the fallenness of the world. So it, it's, it's God feeling compassion for people. That's his, that's his mercy. You, you could argue that him executing judgment is a merciful act. Like, like he, he has mercy on, on the weak who have suffered. He, he has mercy on those who have endured death. He, he has mercy on, on those who have suffered under violent regimes. And, and so in his mercy, he's going to put the world to right. And in his mercy, he's created a world, a way to be reconciled to himself. Hmm. This is a concept that has been really intriguing to me over the past several years. As we were preparing for today, Hunter, I mentioned this to you, but an idea Dave brought up in a sermon a few years ago was that to those who are actively experiencing oppression, the idea of judgment against an unjust authority or regime or something that they are suffering under is good news. And I'm keenly aware that my generation has not lived through a major global upheaval like the generations that lived through World War One, World War Two, lived through. We we are like today as we're talking this, Russia is invading Ukraine, and the whole world order feels suddenly very, very unstable as a result. It may be that we are going to enter a period of of great world upheaval when we might have greater appreciation for the need for God to do this. I, I do sometimes wonder if some of our misunderstandings or objections to judgment just arise from the fact that we live in a pretty peaceful, comfortable, affluent corner of the world. And so life is just not as brutal for us as it is for people in many other parts of the world and has been for most of history. Mm -hmm. In the passage that you read from Matthew 13, there's a separation of the, the weeds from the wheat, the crop. So what Jesus was talking about preserving his people who would live in his kingdom and who he described as shining um, with the righteousness of the sun. In that image, in the separation, there is a sort of cleansing taking place. And this is a theme that is present in other passages, both in the Old Testament and the New, that depict judgment. It's intriguing to me that in the judgment that was poured out on Jesus on the cross, that he offers because of his reception of judgment, he is able to offer his righteousness, and that is the mode of cleansing. But for someone who rejects him or the offer of the, cleans the cleansing and the imputed righteousness that he can provide, then after that after the rejection of the cleansing through Christ, then there is a different sort of cleansing that has to take place that is executed through the judgment that Jesus is talking about. That That's a good observation. Cleansing is a parallel concept integrated with judgment. And one of the things that's been helpful for me to think through is what has to happen to put anything to right that has 
been sullied or has been um, disheveled or has been corrupted? Like what what has to happen? And the illustration that I'll use a lot, even in my in my teaching and preaching, is of my own home. You know, like what has to happen to to put your home to right when your kids have destroyed it, or what? How do you do it? And you cleanse it basically. And cleansing has two dimensions. There are some things that have to just be put out. They, they're they just put out in, in order for life to flourish in your home. And there are other things that can be washed and can be put back to good purpose. And so Jesus actually gives us this option. Do you want the washing, cleansing, or do you want the put out, uh, cleansing? He, he gives us that option. And his blood cleanses us from all unrighteousness. So the work of Christ on the cross reconciles us to God. It, it takes our judgment. This is sometimes what we call justification. It takes our judgment and reconciles us to God. And then it begins this process of sanctifying or of cleansing us from all unrighteousness. This is the process of, of sanctification. It's powerful and it's effective for that. So if you want the washing and being put back to good use option, it is available to you in the person of Christ. And if if you reject that, then God's still going to cleanse the world and put it to right, and that's going to mean putting some things and some people out. Hmm. That idea of putting some people out helps lead us into some of the Old Testament images of God's judgment. I like that we began in the New Testament because at times, if you just track through the Bible from beginning to end, you get a sense that the Old Testament God was sort of um, heartless or ruthless. And then as you read on into the New Testament, that Jesus is a kinder, gentler version Mm. of God. But Jesus taught that in his coming, in the reconciliation and restoration that he offered, there's also judgment that is necessary to make that fully effective. And so I'm glad that we talked about (laughs) those ideas that Jesus taught first. Where should we pick up in the Old Testament? Well, the New Testament picture of judgment is not inconsistent with the Old Testament. Just like the the coming of the kingdom of God unites the storyline of the Bible. So the the picture of how the kingdom is going to come in the New Testament that we get in the t- parables of Jesus that we get in Revelation, this teaching is again not new. It's it's there in the Old Testament, and one of the ways the Old Testament teaches us is through what theologians call types or typology, which are historical events which embody in an imperfect way the fullness or the picture of the perfect that is to come in Christ and in his kingdom. So, for example, David is a type of Christ. He is a king who reigns over God's people and God's land, who, has, who is a man after God's own heart. He's an imperfect type <laughs> because he's a, he's a sinful man, and his kingdom doesn't last and doesn't endure. So he's an imperfect type of Christ. We get another type of of the coming of the kingdom of God in the flood, for example. The flood is God sees the corruption that is great on the earth. He is grieved by it in his heart. And he decides that he is going to cleanse the world. So the flood literally cleanses the world of the violence and the corruption that has man has created on, on the earth. The flood is, a, is cleansing, and after the flood, the world is refreshed, and, and life begins again, having been cleansed of, of all this corruption, and then God creates a way to save people through that judgment so that they can see the new world. That's, that's the ark. It's an imperfect picture. It's an imperfect type because the people who are saved through the judgment are actually not cleansed of sin. There's there's a, a story of the, like the fall of Noah. He, he, he sins after he's seen this great work of God. And, and so there's this sense of like, this is kind of what it's going to look like, but it's not perfect yet. The most difficult or, or maybe troublesome to us type 
that we see in the Old Testament is Israel conquering the promised land, the land of Canaan. And this raises all kinds of questions about does God sanction violence? Does he sanction some kind of ethnic cleansing or some kind of genocide? You'll, you'll see that raised as an objection to the Bible, and it's probably the, one of the parts of the Bible that's at face value hardest for us to make sense of. So this type of judgment that you're introducing us to now, this conception is taking place at the point in time when God is leading Israel into the land that he has promised them, at this point into Canaan, and asking them to possess, is the word that we have rendered in our English translations, to possess the land. And there are some stories and accounts in that time period in Israel's history that talk about them taking over cities. So for instance, the fall of Jericho, when they marched around the city and the walls collapsed and they conquered the city of Jericho. There are these types of accounts as God is asking his people to go into the land that he's possessed. How does this help us understand God's judgment? Well, the first thing to see is that Israel is a type, again, an imperfect picture Nonetheless, there's real correspondence, a type of the kingdom of God. They're going to be God's people who live in God's land under God's good rule and reign. And the land he wants to give them is apparently a land flowing with milk and honey, he says. So it's almost depicted as a new Garden of Eden. This land is occupied by people groups called Canaanites who... When you read the Old Testament narrative, God describes them as exceedingly evil, wicked, full of idolatry. So the picture here is God is going to go into a a part of the earth that is corrupted with idolatry and with evil, and he's going to take it back as his own possession. I mean, this is this is basically the story of the coming of the kingdom. God's going to take the whole earth back as his as his possession. That's the the big narrative in which we have to kind of understand the the Israel possessing the land. Then I also think it's sometimes helpful to look a little bit more closely at some of the details of what they're being commanded to do, because what it looks like on face value, and I think what some of the scholarly research would say is actually happening or maybe not quite the same. So anyway, maybe we take it in that order. Maybe we kind of talk big picture, what are they doing? And then a little bit more detail, like what's actually happening when they take possession of the land. Mm -hmm. It's interesting to note as well that when we just talk about these passages, it can come off as God had chosen his people and now he is giving his people agency to just slaughter the inhabitants of the land. But in the narrative sequence, just prior to them actually possessing the land, God had actually judged and executed a type of cleansing against his own people, his chosen people. He had brought them out of Egypt, led them into the wilderness. And then because they didn't trust him and they engaged in their own sort of idolatry, he actually said that there was an entire generation of people who would not receive the promise and a new generation had been raised up. And so he had just done, performed this same sort of action upon his own chosen people. It's a really good point. And later in their history, when Israel is in the land and they practice idolatry and rebel against God, he, he's, he raises up foreign powers to come in and, and invade them and to drive them out of the land as well. So, so there is a picture of God being equal in how mm-hmm. he treats people. I think it's important to get the big picture, though, and there's a couple of places in Deuteronomy. I'm actually reading through Deuteronomy right now in my quiet time, and there's a couple of places that I think depict this that I just pulled. One is Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 5. God is preparing this people who are going to go in and possess the land, and he says, it's not because of your righteousness or the uprightness of your heart that you're going to possess the land. But because of the wickedness of these nations, the Lord your God is driving them out before you, and that he may confirm the word that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. So there's a clear emphasis that God is displeased 
with the corruption and the idolatry that is being practiced. And he is going to, the term is drive them out, meaning he's going to dispossess them from the land so that he can begin to establish a picture of what his own justice looks like in that land. A little bit later, in Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 17, he says, You shall devote them to complete destruction, that they may not teach you to do according to all their abominable practices that they have done for their gods, and so and so you would sin against the Lord your God. So, so here, God is saying, I don't want their idolatry to corrupt you, and I'm not confident in your ability to resist that. So, uh, you, you need to you need to uh, drive them out of the land. Now, even as I read that, it probably raised questions for people like you'll devote them to complete destruction. Mm-hmm. Like, what is God actually commanding Israel to do here? In that question, what is God actually commanding Israel to do here? I think this is what you were mentioning a moment ago in that we can turn to some scholars to help us understand some of the nuance in these passages. It doesn't mean that there wasn't a very real sort of judgment being executed against Forceful. People. Forceful judgment. And people died. Mm-hmm. Um, and so... There's still plenty to wrestle with and to ask God to help us understand in these passages. But we also can turn to some scholars who have studied this and help us understand some of those details, maybe. What what really were these passages denoting when they're saying things like this, driving the people out? I appreciate that you brought that up. And there are several things that when you drill down into what it apparently meant in that context, it probably meant something slightly different than Lee, what we hear when we read these same things in in kind of our English uh, understanding. So, for example, the cities, you'll see Israel conquering cities. Like the first city they conquer is Jericho. The second city they conquer is Ai. I believe that's how you say it. It's pronounced A-I or spelled A-I. These cities they conquer... We hear city and we think population center teeming with thousands and thousands of people. Cities back then were more like military forts, and they weren't population centers. They didn't tend to have lots of people living in them. They tended to mainly have soldiers living in them. Sometimes they would have a few services for the soldiers, like, for example, in Jericho, there's an inn in Jericho, and every inn would have a local prostitute. And so that that's part of what the city is. But but this city is probably more like hundreds of soldiers, a, a, a military fortress where hundreds of soldiers were stationed. And these cities would be set in strategic locations by kings, and kings were always military commanders back then. So these cities would be set in strategic locations by kings. These fortresses were set in strategic locations, and they would kind of provide security for that area. And most of the population would live in the unfortified countryside, you know, surrounding that area. So when God commands Israel, for example, to go in and to capture Jericho, he is basically commanding them to go in and capture the the fortified military fortress of that area. And by capturing that, you kind of have now control of the whole. Mm-hmm. You brought up a question earlier. You used the term ethnic cleansing. Another term that sometimes is introduced in these conversations is genocide. Mm-hmm. So, for instance, in the, the account of the city of Ai in Joshua— there's some startling language that does say that there would be the destruction of 12,000 men and women as our English translation is rendered. So, and that is shocking to read and difficult to read and to understand. And so what about this, the charge of ethnic cleansing or genocide inherent in these passages? There's several ways we could address this. First would be to note that Israel was mainly commanded to drive people out of the land, not to kill them all. 
So there, that's still hard to get our minds around, right? But but again, within the picture of the coming of the kingdom, this is an imperfect type. You know, it is God driving out people who are practicing idolatry so that he can set up flourishing in his land. So it was more of a driving out than a killing. There was a there was battle though, right? And you mentioned the note in Joshua eight twenty five where it says twelve thousand men and women and I. It appears that the term thousand was a a term that referred to a military unit. And so it's not necessarily referring to a literal thousand people, like a military unit might have been a hundred people, or it might have been ten or twelve people. So twelve thousand would be like twelve military units. And the phrase men and women was kind of an idiom for everyone. So when you see those two things and you kind of know what a city was, like it would if a, if a city is really just a fortified military fortress, it wouldn't even hold. 12,000 people. So when you know what a city was and you know how language was used, then what this appears to be describing is Israel conquering this military stronghold and completely destroying it and the mostly the soldiers and and the commanders who occupied that, which was probably something quite a bit less than 12,000. I want to be clear that we're not attempting to gloss over that there was, as you mentioned, force used and there was actual loss of life. Sometimes, though, when we read these passages, we can conjure up ideas in our mind, images of a mighty army coming in and just crushing all the inhabitants of the land. And I think one of the most interesting facts in in this whole discussion as I've read more and sat with this and wrestled with it and prayed and asked God to help me understand. And I can't claim that I do understand all of this yet. But um, one of the interesting facts that we've discussed, Hunter, previously, and that I want to introduce here is that that's not actually the depiction. Even in the story of Jericho that I mentioned before, their battle strategy, marching around a city, for several days and blowing a trumpet and blowing a trumpet um, wasn't the image that we sometimes have in our mind of an invading army who's coming to crush a land. In fact, the armies of Israel, such as they were, would have been relatively weak against the Canaanite armies who they were facing. They would have been, and they would not have been strong enough at this point in their history to actually drive all the inhabitants of the land out. So they they were given that task, but it appears that that task was to be executed over a, a pretty long period of time. And the beginning task was to go in and to conquer these strongholds. That's what you really see described in the book of Joshua. But the rest of the task would be, would be gradual. You actually get a glimpse of this in Exodus chapter 23. And Exodus 23, um, God says this, Little by little I will drive them out before you until you have increased and possessed the land. The the picture here is you're going to go in, you're going to conquer these strongholds. You are now going to have authority in the land. Then as you increase, as you multiply, you are going to be able to possess the fullness of the land. Unfortunately, that's what Israel does not do. They they don't give themselves to finishing the task of possessing the land. They kind of settle in, and then they begin to be tempted by the idolatrous practices of the Canaanites who have remained. And so they begin to take on this false religion and become corrupted as the Canaanites had. And, and so they don't become the 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 pit picture of the kingdom of God, but but the point we're making here is that God actually envisioned a more of a progressive process than a go in and just kill everybody kind of process. Mm, and that's what depi- is depicted in that Exodus 23 passage, to drive out the people little by little. That's right. So if you put all this together, the 
and you kind of understand what some of the language means and you understand what cities were and you see that Canaanites actually did remain in the land and that God had envisioned this in Exodus and it's going to be a gradual process, then then the the whole picture that starts to emerge is is something like this. God commands Israel to go in and capture these military strongholds where these kings who kings would have also been like religious leaders. So they practice idolatry. He commands them to go in and to drive out these leaders and these kings who were leading these people in idolatry and and to possess the land. He even uh, commands them to do that in a way that emphasizes that it's not Israel's military might, but it's God's power that, that, that drives them out. So, for example, the kind of ridiculous battle strategy of Jericho of march around the walls seven times and blow your trumpets, you know, it's not going to win many modern wars. <laughs> and, and, and so he, he commands them to do this in a way that emphasizes his own power, not theirs. And then he envisions a process of them gradually filling the land and establishing right worship and justice in the land. That's that's the picture that he that he envisions. So it's really not ever a command even to just go in and kill everybody in the land. It's it's really not a genocide and it's not an clean an ethnic cleansing. It it is a gradual possession. Mm-hmm. An establishment of a people in a place, a kingdom, through that gradual possession. Speculatively, I could even maybe make the case that this is analogous to what is going to happen when Jesus returns. <laughs> when Jesus returns, we know that he will judge the earth. He will he will not leave anything evil or or idolatrous in the earth. And he's going to reign from a, quote, new Jerusalem. And yet we have to go, there may be work to be done for God's people to now bring all of creation into its flourishing, not not by eradicating evil from the world, but kind of like they were called to do in the garden. Like it was to, it was to fill the earth, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion. So there may be good creative work to be done for eternity to bring all of the earth into the fullness of its glory, even after Christ returns and drives out all that is evil. Mm. And that's what Israel was intended to do as well, to fill the land and to be God's representatives, his image bearers there in a way that brought about his will and a just society. And they failed to do that. That's right. In our discussion of Jesus' teaching on judgment in the New Testament, we contested that there's mercy still in that message. Do we see that? Do we see this same message of mercy and patience in the accounts of God's judgment in the Old Testament? You do. And the first picture you get of it is way back in Genesis 15 when God's making his promise, his covenant with Abraham. And God promises this land to Abraham at that time. <laughs> but, but, he, but he says he says it this way um, in Genesis 15, verse 12. He says, And they shall come back here in the fourth generation. That means your people, your descendants, will come back here in the fourth generation for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. And and that meant like they're going to come back here 400 years later. And, and so there's this sense of like God has this plan and these Amorites live in this land right now and they're practicing idolatry, but God's going to actually let that continue for a long period of time in his patience with them. You see it depicted in the story of uh, the prophet Jonah and the city of Nineveh. Again, the picture here is Israel is to uh, turn this land into God's kingdom, but God sends a prophet to give Nineveh, this evil and corrupt city, to give Nineveh an opportunity to repent before he judges them. And they do. They, they, they repent. And so there's that picture. 
there's the picture of Rahab the prostitute uh, in Jericho who lives in Jericho and and she actually perceives that this God of Israel is the one to be worshiped and she turns to the God of Israel before her city her stronghold is invaded and she is saved and becomes part of the lineage of the Messiah Jesus right so there are these pictures of opportunity for the Canaanites to turn to God and to repent of their idolatry, and he gives them grace. Okay, so this image and these ideas are coming into a bit clearer view. Now, God is working to establish his kingdom in such a way that his people are called to him, that judgment is executed as a means of this dividing line for his kingdom. There are some people who have not accepted the opportunity for forgiveness. Those people are outside of God's kingdom in the images of judgment through the type of Israel in the Old Testament and in Jesus' teaching on a place of judgment in the New Testament. There are people inside God's kingdom who are his image bearers, who are bringing about God's good rule and reign along with him on the earth in a way that allows the people in that kingdom to flourish. So I can understand that. In the Old Testament, how uncomfortable or not for me as a modern reader, this use of force was the way that God chose to execute judgment, to work to bring about his kingdom and the flourishing of the people within that kingdom on earth. And then in Jesus' teaching that there will be a time of judgment in which people are separated into God's kingdom, out of God's kingdom. But we sort of live in this in-between. I know, too, that Christ will come and establish his kingdom on earth you mentioned Revelation. This is what we're taught in Revelation, that Jesus will return as king, and in other passages in the epistles in the New Testament. How can we in this in-between time understand God's judgment? Well, I'm glad you asked that question, because another accusation that comes out of reading these Old Testament accounts is, okay, so if God authorized a people to go into this land and to drive out the idolaters, then isn't that really dangerous? Like, like won't Christians use that today as authorization to try to drive people out of places they they want to possess? And and I think we, we see what have has happened with more militant uh, forms of Islam, and people are like, that's the danger of religion, you know? It, it teaches them that, like, you have an authorization by God to kill the uh, the the infidels if they don't convert, you know? And, and so people get worried about that, right? And the thing we would just point out is the command that was given to Israel was limited to them in that time, in that place— and nowhere is that command given to Christians. In fact, we are reminded that vengeance now belongs to the Lord. And so we don't avenge ourselves. And the picture that emerges in the New Testament is the because of the perfect work of Christ that has now come. Because of the perfect work of Christ that's now come. First of all, perfect in his atonement, perfect in his resurrection— when he returns, will be perfect in his justice. There will not be a single complaint. Like every mouth will be stopped. And and I think we're given that image of mouths being stopped to say, when you see God's perfect justice executed in Christ, you actually won't even be able to raise an objection to it because it'll be so wise and so perfect. So now that the perfect has come in Christ, we wait for him to to bring justice, and we are not given the task of cleansing the world. We are given the task of being cleansed ourselves, and we are given the task, like Israel, of resisting the idolatry that is around us, and we are given the task of bringing 
the spheres of of our life where we have agency, and it really starts in our own lives, in our own families, in our church, in our homes, of bringing those under the rule and reign of God in a way that demonstrates His His beauty and His justice. And then to the extent we have agency in the world, we can demonstrate what God's justice looks like in the world, but we're not given the prerogative of judgment. We're, we're told to wait for the perfect judgment to come in Christ. And so that's how we obey Him. Also, is it appropriate to say, sometimes we talk about or a term we use is that Jesus taught a gospel of peace. Does that have something to do with how he was, as you said, that which was perfect, the perfect fulfillment of that satisfied the need for God's holiness and righteousness? I like the direction you're going with that. And what the New Testament marries up is that us being able to live peacefully in the world, which means to endure a lot of evil and a lot of corruption and to patiently bear with the corruption of the world while not participating in it, but also suffering the, the consequences of living in this fallen world. What actually gives us the spiritual resource to do that is knowing that God will judge one day. So often it's said like, well, the problem with a like God who judges is that creates judgmental people. So we need a non-judgmental God to create non-judgmental people. The logic of, of the New Testament actually works in the in a different way. It goes, what you need is knowledge of a of a perfectly holy, just, righteous God who will judge. That's the kind of knowledge that will allow you to trust him with that so that you can live at peace with all people and suffer uh, the fate of life in this world and, until it comes perfectly. The presence of the Spirit not only allows us, I think, to live peaceably in a world, even one that in which we experience the effect of sin and brokenness and corruption, it also, the Spirit's presence also enables us to genuinely love the people who, nope, not the, that's not, I don't want to say it like that. Um, the Spirit's presence also enables us to love in a genuine way that is representative of Jesus' sacrificial love for us. Because he loved us while we were his enemies, we therefore can and are enabled to, are actually empowered to love even people who may seem to be against us or against the message of the gospel. Because we trust that ultimately Jesus' desire is that all would come to him, that all would come to repentance and experience his forgiveness and be given life. And we have knowledge of the fact that he's going to one day put the whole world to right and everything that is evil and is corrupt, including the evil and corruption that's done directly to us, will be vindicated. And so... Both the patience of God in wanting all to reach repentance and the knowledge that God would judge, these two things together are what kind of provide us the ability to love and serve this broken, fallen world and love and serve sinful people. Mm -hmm. And to embody this gospel of peace that's been given to us. And we ourselves are recipients of grace. So we mm -hmm. we are not the good people who mm -hmm. God has picked from out among the bad people and taught us now to patiently bear with the bad people. We ourselves are recipients of God's grace. And so we want others to experience that as well. Mm -hmm. So we have really just scratched the surface <laughs> of this have. topic in our conversation today. And I know you have a couple of references, Hunter, that have you've mentioned are helpful for you. Do you want to share those with our listeners in case they want to read more? The first is a book that we've mentioned several times on this podcast, I believe. It's called Skeletons in God's Closet by Joshua Ryan Butler, and it deals with judgment. It deals with holy war, and so it's, a, it's an excellent book. A second book, which is a little bit newer that I'd recommend, is by Dan Kimball, and it's called How Not to Read the Bible. And he deals with a lot of the hard questions, including 
the Old Testament cleansing of the land. He, he deals with that there. Both of these books are written at a popular level, and they're summarizing uh, some really good scholarship that's been done. So if if you look at the footnotes in both of these books, you'll you'll see some some other scholarly or more scholarly works being cited, and those works they're citing are very trustworthy. But but I think for people starting out, those two books would be a great place to start. I would also add I just picked up the Biblical Theology NIV Study Bible and <laughs> edited by D. A. Carson, and it has fantastic notes and explanations about these things as well that that summarize some of this scholarship as well. All right, Hunter, thanks for joining me today. Great conversation. Um, I don't know if this episode has uh, answered questions or caused more questions, but whichever it is, we would love to hear from you. You can send icebreaker questions. Also, next week, we are going to set aside time for a question and response episode specifically around the topics that we've been discussing these last three weeks. So in making sense of the Bible, big themes in the Bible, the law, judgment. If you have questions about any of these topics, whether attached to our conversations or not, we would love to hear from you. And if we can, we'll take time to respond to them on the podcast. Send all those things anytime to podcast at fellowshipdenver.org. Hey, this is Autumn. I'm jumping in here for a quick moment to invite you to some classes that we have coming up. We call these foundations classes because in them, we look at foundational theological understanding of the Bible. And while we do set aside these classes and times periodically to help us engage with the Bible more deeply and to grow in our understanding of God and his word and ourselves. Our hope always is that these discussions here on the Vision for Life podcast and what we discuss in our foundations classes actually affect the way that we show up in the world and the way that we share the life and truth and hope of the gospel with our neighbors, our communities, with the people around us each day. We would love for you to join us for these classes. They will begin on Wednesday, March 2nd and take place for four consecutive weeks. You can find out more information and register at fellowshipdenver.org slash calendar. Thanks for joining us on the Vision for Life podcast. Thanks to Adam Englund for our theme music and to our producer, Jesse Cowan.